mechanism, then it's not active. It won't initiate muscle contraction. And this will ultimately result in muscle relaxation. That's why a lot of times the DRC and kept magnesium supplements, a lot of them are, magnesium is actually one of the treatments that's been proposed for restless leg syndrome. Have you ever heard of that? Or it's also used as a muscle relaxant in some cases because it will prevent undue uh, muscle contraction. And we'll cover a little bit more of this later, especially in smooth muscle cells when we're talking about heart disease. And finally, magnesium is involved with ion channel regulation. So again, the sodium potassium ATPase, it has ATP right in the name, so you can guess that magnesium can be involved with this. So magnesium is not only involved for its role in neutralization of ATP, but it's also involved in the um, stability of the sodium potassium ATPase as well. And magnesium also is a potent calcium channel blocker. So it prevents calcium entry into the cytoplasm of the cell. Um, it both prevents influx from the extracellular space, and it also prevents um, the calcium release from the endoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm. So its overall effects, in, when you're looking at the cytosol or the intracellular compartment of the cell, it keeps both uh, sodium and calcium low within the cell, keeps them high on the outside, and it keeps potassium high on the inside of the cell, where it helps to regulate these functions. So overall, mag magnesium balance is essential to keeping things how they should be, keeping the intracellular cations where they should be, and keeping the extracellular cations out into the uh, extracellular space where they should be. So overall, here's a review of the functions of, H, um, of this pathway. So you, you want to remember that magnesium is important in bone health. Um, remember that it, where it's found, it's found both on the inside of the bone and it's found on the bone surface as well. Um, remember that it is involved in the tra uh, phosphate transfer reactions due to its uh, essential uh, role in ATP activity. It also is involved in the formation and stabilization of enzymes. We'll look back at that pathway that I covered, especially with the PDC, and see how it stabilizes enzyme complexes. Uh, it also stabilizes DNA. Uh, it is involved in second messenger pathways as well. And remember those two that we went over. Um, it is an inhibitor or an antagonist of the clotting cascade, whereas calcium is an agonist, so know the role of those two. And it also regulates ion channel activity. So now, since we've covered all of these functions, and I'd like to relate it back to that very first slide um, in terms of how the calcium to magnesium ratio affects heart disease. Uh, so I'd like to spend a little bit of time covering how hypomagnesemia can contribute to the metabolic syndrome. Um, if you all remember, metabolic syndrome is characterized by a high blood pressure, um, insulin resistance, low HDL, which is a good form of cholesterol, um, high triglycerides, and high abdominal adiposity. So probably one of the primary roles that magnesium has been implicated in, or that hypomagnesemia has been found to influence, is its role in hypertension. Um, this is going back over what we just covered. But in a normal cell, you have high, uh, high potassium and magnesium on the intracellular space and you have low calcium and uh, sodium within an intracellular space. And this is basically results in a happy cell, keeping the cell how it should be, keeping its normal movement. When in a hypomagnesemic state, when you start to have a lower intracellular concentration of magnesium, this actually results in a twofold occurrence. It has resulted in increased cal influx of calcium due to the fact that there is decreased, there's low magnesium and it's not blocking calcium channels. So you'll have a influx of magnesium into the intracellular space. You also have um, lower, uh, lower potassium within the intracellular space as it, also, it not only decreases the activity of the sodium potassium pump, but um, it loses magnesium-induced inhibition of potassium channels. So magnesium generally, on the, when it's in the intracellular space at normal concentrations, will inhibit these potassium channels from opening and will inhibit potassium from flowing out of the cell. Um, when you have low magnesium, these channels will not be inhibited and potassium will flow at a greater rate to that extracellular 
computer space. So overall, this results in um, primarily interest, in decreased interest cellular potassium, but also when you start thinking about the decreased functions of the sodium and potassium ATPase, it also results in an increased interest of your sodium. And it also results in increased interest of your calcium due to the fact that it's not blocking the calcium channels anymore. So overall, how does this affect hypertension? Well, when you have increased in interest of your calcium, then um, you'll have an increase in muscle contraction. And that, due to that role I was telling you about, calcium should generally be fairly low in the cytosolic space. Actually, the initiation, if you've ever taken exercise physiology, is involved when uh, calcium is released from the endoplasmic reticulum into the cytosolic space. That is what initiates muscle contraction. And that occurs through the binding of calcium to the myosin light chain kinase. Uh, when calcium is bound, it activates this myosin light chain kinase which activates the myosin light chain, which leads to muscle contraction. So when there's low intracellular calcium, there's not a whole lot of activation of this myosin. But when muscle contraction is initiated, then you'll have um, increased intracellular calcium. In addition, uh, lower potassium also results in partial depolarization of between the membrane potential. Uh, if you remember back to action potentials, uh, it's when you want a generally negative, um, uh, a negative resting potential, and then the depolarization causes the contraction of the muscle fiber. Um, lower K plus and higher intracellular calcium or uh, intracellular sodium will result in a partial depolarization. So there's actually less of a voltage gradient between the resting membrane potential and the activation potential. So there's less of an activation that is needed to initiate contraction. And this can result in muscle cramps and skeletal muscle fibers, uh, vasoconstriction mainly due to this role of calcium that I was talking about in muscle contraction, and also arrhythmia, which is a regular heartbeat. And this is due to this partial depolarization of smooth muscle cells within the cardiac muscle. In addition to these indirect roles, uh, magnesium also has a direct role on hypertension due to its, um, it actually augments the production of prostacycline, which is a potent vas vasodilator. Um, this graph on the right shows that with increased treatment, these are um, actually magnesium treatment of vascular endothelial cells, so just um, cells that exist on the outside of the vasculature. Um, with increased magnesium treatment, uh, you have an increase in ephedrine stimulated um, PGF production. In adi um, addition to prostacycline, also um, magnesium is involved in the product in nitric oxide synthesis, which is also a potent vasodilator, if you remember. So, in periods where you have impaired magnesium status or low uh, hypomagnesemia, you'll have impaired production of these vasodilators, which uh, prostacycline and nitric oxide. And combined with this indirect effect of low magnesium on basal constriction, you'll overall have a more constriction and uh, hypertension as a result. So there have been a lot of studies over about the past 40 years that have been done on this relationship between magnesium supplementation, magnesium status, and hypertension. Uh, this was actually a recent meta-analysis which uh, analyzes multiple studies. Um, there were 20 studies that they analyzed in their meta-analysis, um, 14 with hypertensive individuals and six with normotensive individuals. And so a total of 1,220 <laughs> subjects were involved in this analysis. And what they found over all of these studies was that there was a dose-dependent uh, relationship, that magnesium has a dose-dependent hypertensive, uh, anti-hypertensive effect, uh, both on systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. So with increased magnesium supplementation, um, anywhere from 10 uh, millimolar, which is around 243 milligrams of supplementation, all the way up into a, almost a gram of magnesium, there is a direct relationship between uh, and a, a lowering of blood pressure in these individuals with various treatment times. What they recommended in this study was that um, they should further increase the dose of magnesium and to do more studies with these higher doses since there weren't a lot of studies up here to see if there was a um, 
more potent to help back to the magnesium with these higher doses. Because the majority of the studies were done down in this range, which they said may be why they only saw a slight effect of magnesium on hypertension. <laughs> So kind of as a segue into our next look at magnesium and metabolic syndrome, which steps of glucose metabolism are magnesium involved in? Okay, most people got this right again. I was hoping that. So, the Krebs cycle, our citric acid cycle is the Krebs cycle. And as we went over, magnesium is evolved with every step of the energy production pathway with a glucose on base basis. So, with magnesium being involved in every step of glucose metabolism, you can see, you start to see how hypomagnesemia could be involved in insulin resistance. But the relationship isn't quite as simple or as straightforward as you might think. Um, one of the ways that magnesium results in is insulin resistance is magnesium is involved with the, um, to, magnesium has been shown to inhibit PKC. Uh, PKC actually um, is an inhibitor of IRS1, which is insulin receptor signal 1. Uh, that's actually the receptor when insulin binds to the cellular receptor. IRS1 uh, mediates its intracellular effects. So when you have low magnesium status, um, you won't have that magnesium-induced inhibition of PKC. So PKC will be overactive, you could say. It will have increased activity. Um, increased activity of PKC will lead to an overall decreased activity. Um, it will result in overphosphorylation of the IRS1 or insulin signal receptor 1. Um, when IRS1 is phosphorylated, it cannot carry out its downstream functions, which is overall through <coughs> PFD kinase to result in glut 4 translocation to the cellular membrane. So overall, hypomagnesemia results in less glut 4 translocation to the cellular membrane in response to insulin. And since that is the primary role of insulin in regulating glucose metabolism, if you don't have um, this insulin stimulated um, GLUT4 translocation, then you aren't going to be able to upregulate glucose um, uptake into the cell when you um, have insulin binding. So this decreases the effect of insulin and leads overall to an increased glucose concentration within the blood. Uh, magnesium is also required in general, like we covered, for glucose metabolism. So if you have a lower intracellular uh, magnesium concentration, you're going to have less of act, uh, activity of these enzymes um, that are involved in glucose metabolism. <laughs> uh, overall, that could result in a buildup of glucose, which would result in decreased um, glucose transport into the cell despite concentration gradients. So this is sort of how this vicious cycle develops. Um, when you have um, hypomagnesemia can result in insulin resistance and overall, in serious cases, can result in um, uncontrolled diabetes or high blood glucose. Uh, if diabetes reaches a certain point, um, like chronic conditions, then blood glucose will actually um, reach a high enough level to where you won't be able to absorb all of it in the kidney. Like we covered, that results in glucose in the urine 
with very high collective glucose concentrations. Um, as we went over with that previous slide, uh, blood, blood glucose or glucose in the urine increases kidney filtration rate. It increases um, basically uh, urine output, and that's why diabetics have increased thirst and in, uh, increased urine. Um, this increased filtration rate, like we said, decreases cation reabsorption, so it actually results in magnesium wasting overall. Um, it will result in increased magnesium excretion. So this is sort of like a vicious cycle feed forward mechanism where a hypomagnesemic state can result in increased blood glucose and increased blood glucose to uh, uncontrolled levels can result in exacerbating hypomagnesemia by resulting in increased magnesium excretion. So as these kind of feed off of each other over and over you can see how this could result in dangerously low levels of magnesium and dangerously high levels of glucose. And finally, we'll look at the role of magnesium in atherosclerosis, um, mainly looking at its involvement with inflammation and cholesterol, and also in clotting factors. So this graph was 